A lecture is. Sorry, thank you. <clears throat> Our next lecture is the fourth annual Dr. Anita Chakravarti lecture on wellness, and. Uh, Introducing our next speaker is uh, Sierra Glass. Uh, pardon my pronunciation. She makes a long journey from the back. Um, apologies, I'm I'm uh, doing a very millennial thing and reading off of my phone, but just because I'm in the middle of a move and my printer is somewhere in the mess there. Um, so apologies for that. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Shaw, presenting the fourth annual Dr. Anita Chakravarti Lecture in Wellness. Dr. Shaw's presentation, entitled, Can Joy in Work Be a Prescription for System Transformation?, is sure to be informed by her role's as a clinician and an administrator. Of her work, Dr. Shaw has said, it gives her the privilege and the opportunity to work with and learn from patients, families, colleagues, and colleagues across our system, from the bedside all the way to system governance and strategy. Dr. Shaw balances a rewarding career in critical care medicine and anesthesiology with clinical and system improvement work at the local, regional, and provincial levels in Saskatchewan. She received her MD in 1995 and completed a residency in anesthesiology in 2000, both from the University of Saskatchewan. She also completed a critical care fellowship at Stanford University in 2001. She is currently the Chief Medical Officer with the Saskatchewan Health Authority and Board Chair for the Saskatchewan Health Quality Council. No stranger to systems level change, Dr. Shaw began her appointment as the Chief Medical Officer on December 4th, 2017 the day that the newly amalgamated Saskatchewan Health Authority began operations. And she brings to the role a focus on continuous improvement and ensuring a system of patient and family-centered care. Dr. Shaw has also been a successful department head of critical care in Saskatoon, a physician leader with the Saskatchewan Surgical Initiative, co-led the Saskatchewan, or Saskatoon Health Region Safer Everyday Breakthrough Initiative, and was the director of the Physician Advocacy and Leadership with the Saskatchewan Medical Association. In 2017, she received the Dr. Dennis A. Kendall Distinguished Service Award for her outstanding contributions to physician leadership and engagement in healthcare quality improvements in the province. Dr. Shaw is looked to as a leader in patient-centered care, physician leadership, continuous improvement, and large-scale change. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Shaw. Good morning, thank you very much for a very kind introduction. And it is just a great honor to be here. I'm a very proud University of Saskatchewan graduate, and I'm a very honored to be delivering the Dr. Anita Chakravarti uh, um, lecture in wellness. And Dr. Chakravarti has known me since I was a medical student in 1994. I have to go back into, into time to, for me to remember that far. And uh, I've always uh, had great admiration for Dr. Chakravarti's work and her inspiration in terms of her view of, her holistic view of wellness and her ability to teach, learn, and uh, always be inspiring. So that when I got asked to do this, I was actually almost uh, fell over because I'm not so sure I'm someone who's an expert in wellness, but I am someone who's very interested in helping to design a system where patients receive better care and physicians in particular feel and receive more joy. And I think that's the connection between uh, the work I do as a clinician, the work I uh, try to do as a system leader, and the, uh, the sense of joy that we all know we should be able to get from our work. I'm on Twitter, and so if you want to find me, it's probably the best way to go. I'm not sure how many of you are on Twitter, but I will give you my email at the end so you can uh, 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 make, make contact with me. I'm usually pretty easy to find. 
So in terms of disclosures, I have no disclosures. I have no affiliations or a payment from any uh, companies. I uh, receive most of my uh, salary right now is with the Saskatchewan Health Authority. I'm a proud faculty member with the University of Saskatchewan. And I am, as uh, was mentioned, I'm board chair with Health Quality Council. I'll be speak, I think it's impossible to change hats. That's who I am. Uh, but most of all, I'm a practicing physician who believes strongly that our system can and, be, can and should be better. I have lots of biases, and I do think Saskatchewan's an amazing place to be from, and it's an amazing place to be practicing medicine right now. So when I was asked to create objectives for what we're going to talk about today, I want us to start off by exploring the relationship for why it's so important that we as physicians work on teams where people are well, because that connects directly to safety. I want us to talk a little bit about what are the system factors that contribute to both personal and collective wellness and then focus on some strategies that we, I think, can build into our system and into our own personal lives so that we can uh, feel better at work and have better results for our patients. So I, you've already heard a bit about me. Um, I was born in England. That's where a small bit of my accent comes from. And my family um, moved us, and I'm very grateful that they moved us to Regina when I was about 10 years old. And when I went and moved away to a very big city called Saskatoon to go to uh, university for medical school, I really did see something very amazing here. And I can remember telling my, at the time, boyfriend and now husband that if, if, I, could, if I could work at this place, I would be pretty happy with where I ended up in life. And I feel very grateful that that is exactly what I've been able to do. I think Saskatoon, for me, has been a very important part of who I am. And it's because of who we are and who our values, uh, I think, of what we value. I have to remember where to click. So I had trained here. Um, I thought that medicine was absolutely amazing, and I still do. I thought that it was absolutely uh, such a privilege to connect with families, connect with patients, and to uh, work in teams where everyone was so skilled. And I really loved my work. I went away to uh, the US. I did some of my training there. And I'm very grateful of, uh, that I had that experience. But I knew well, even though I was there and I had opportunities there, that I needed to come home. This is me, and this is where I live. And uh, this is an old picture, but I'm one of the SAS Talks uh, poster children. I see another couple uh, of us are around here as well. But it really was the best choice for me. And it says here, returning to Saskatchewan is the best choice for me and my family. And I had such joy in work. Every day I got up, I was like, oh, one of the luckiest people in the world. And I really had a hard time thinking about how could anyone not have joy in work? How could you at all you know, dread going to work or feel bored? In, in the, I work at that time primarily in the operating room in the intensive care unit. But after several years of showing up every day and doing, I think, a pretty good job, I started to feel a little disconnect uh, between that joy that I was feeling and uh, my, my desire to further change. And there's many reasons why, and I don't want to talk a lot about why burnout can happen. I don't think that I got to the point of burnout, but I definitely realized I was getting increasingly frustrated when people would come to me and say, Have, you know, this isn't working or that's not working. And I, I just felt myself not having that same sense of love for my work. And that is close to burnout. I don't think I actually met the definition. Uh, burnout is something that was first described by a psychologist in 1974. He was describing what he was experiencing in a uh, clinic that was a, uh, it was a, I think an American psychologist, and it was important that this was a no-pay clinic for people living with drug addiction. And he was looking at what makes people lose their joy in work and what is burnout. And he started to describe that. So really, it's in the 70s uh, that we started to understand that burnout was a thing. And there are many definitions for burnout, but the one that I work from is a depersonalization. So you kind of shut yourself down, and you don't bring yourself fully to work. You don't get the same sense of uh, personal accomplishment, that you've made a difference and that you're doing what you intended to do. And the most important one to me as someone who thought I was a nice, caring person is that you develop empathy fatigue, meaning that you really don't, uh, you, don't you lose the ability to connect and relate to the situations and the circumstances of the people that you're both working with and the people that you're caring for. And it's a bit controversial whether burnout is actually increasing or are we understanding that it is, is our, is our understanding and recognition of burnout increasing? We know that it's very dependent on the environment in which you work. If you look at studies, it can be anywhere from as low as 
of the workforce in healthcare has burnout, or it can be as high as 70 to 80 percent of the workforce has burnout. And I work in critical care, and that's one of the areas where we know that it's a high risk. Uh, higher risk ones are critical care, emergency rooms, and working in situations um, with increasing complexity. And so I, was, I am at risk, and I, I think about that a lot. But I'm actually not sure if it's increasing, or like I said, if it's just something that we recognize more. I'm not gonna spend much more time talking about what is burnout, but I am gonna talk about why should we care about it. Well, I should care about it as a person because I wasn't loving my job as much. It was just a job. And I feel like healthcare is one of those things where we should be able to get joy. We went into it to try and make a difference. We have the ability to heal. We have the ability to care. We have the ability to have impact on patients' lives. So if I lose that, that I'm really not fully living the life that I intended. And we also know about the problems of mental health. We know about the problems of suicide. We know the problems of addiction and the, and the, the, the strife that this causes, not just for us as individuals, but for those of the people who love us our most, our families. So we need to care about burnout as people. But as a system leader, I need to care about burnout because I know that patients, ex the experience of our patients suffers if staff is feeling depersonalized and not feeling like they're making a difference. I know that patients, this is all, this is all science behind this. We know that patient outcomes are worse when there's high levels of burnout within the workplace. Length of stays go up. Transmission of MRSA go up. Complications like drug errors made by nurses um, I shouldn't, I'm not blaming nurses. The, 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 the rate of drug errors within a nursing team go up when we have higher rates of burnout. So outcome is worse. People don't show up to work. You have increased absenteeism, and that's a safety risk and a cost to the system because you have to backfill and it creates churn. We know that productivity goes down. We know that safety actually worsens when the staff is burned out. And all of these things together create an unstable system where costs go up, we have no more money, and uh, we're spending money on the things that we shouldn't be. So as a leader, I really need to care that my work, my colleagues, my team, my system actually is creating wellness and is not creating burnout. This is one of the better studies that you can find. It's a recent one. It's 2015, and it's in a, a psychological journals. And it's showing that in critical care units studied in Switzerland, that when you have physicians and nurses showing up emotionally exhausted, length of stays go up, um, all, uh, mortality rates go up, and you can actually, it's one of the better predictors of how, how, how your team will do is by looking at the levels of exhaustion and burnout within a system. And I've said a little bit about this before, but I really believe that if, if there's any field of work where we should be able to create joy and experience joy, it really is in healthcare. I went into medicine to try to make a difference, and I, I, and, and I know that I can, but if I don't get that sense, it doesn't make, so it doesn't make sense to me, really, when you first look at it. It's almost ironic that healthcare workers have such high rates of burnout and a lot loss of joy. But you look at our work, and it is difficult work that we do. It's physically challenging. We work long hours, often with terrible ergonomics. It's emotionally challenging. We deal with people in crisis. We deal with people who have problems that we may or may not be able to solve. The complexity of the situations within which we work and the complexity of the illnesses that our families and patients bring to our patients and their families bring to us are increasing as people are, as we're getting better at helping people age, we're seeing patients with more chronic co comorbidity and that's more challenging. Uh, there may be a change in expectations. I think there is a change in expectations. I think that physicians are being asked to do more and be more than we anticipated when we maybe went into this field. But we're also seeing changing expectations in that uh, um, uh, doctor doesn't always know best, and that's a bit of a cultural change with uh, being asked to work in different partnerships. Technology, we saw, um, I heard a great talk yesterday about the impacts of technology from Dr. Mendez. Um, but that's a very different world of medicine than, well, than, than I usually train in. And then we, we're actually, uh, <laughs> we're on our phones all the time, whether we're on our phones looking at lab results or on our computers using an EMR. That's definitely been shown to uh, make it harder for physicians to feel joy. And our system is increasingly complex. It was never designed to be, we never designed this system. It just happened. It just, evolved over time and we just keep adding on bits and pieces and that's created a very complex system that's not easy to understand and if we can't understand it how do our patients understand it 
And all of these things together mean that we may be losing, a, we, we don't have a sense of control. And having a sense of control is very important to, to personal wellness and to, person, and to be able, being able to thrive. So that's me talking about all the things that are hard and all the things that don't work. And I don't like speaking from a place of, uh, of deficit. I'm very much a, some people accuse me of being overly optimistic, but I really am someone who wants to talk from a strength-based perspective. So we're gonna switch um, directions a little bit. And instead of talking about what's not working within our work, let's talk about how we can make things work better. Um, this is a, uh, we're increasingly recognizing this, is it's so important that we learn how to stay whole as a person. And I'm very grateful for the leadership and the work that's being done inside our professional organizations, inside this College of Medicine. A lot of it's been led by Anita and, uh, and her teams and, and the people that she's coaching. And that is absolutely vital. We need to understand our personal wellness. We need to build resiliency. We need to have self-awareness and lead self. Like These are absolutely crucial steps. But then I, I, I put forward, I don't think this is controversial anymore, that by itself will always be insufficient. You don't keep putting a canary down to, into the same coal mine and expect a different outcome. So we, there's only so much we can do if we keep putting ourselves and our colleagues into a system that doesn't work. And this is increasingly recognized first in other industries. Um, I would say manufacturing uh, knows this way more than we do, and they do so much more to keep their employees whole because they understand productivity and the bottom line for them matters to their shareholders, and they have to do something to maintain a healthy workforce. Healthcare is late to this, but that means we can lead, uh, lead, uh, learn from them. So employee burnout is not a problem with the, with the individual, it's a problem with the company. And very much, I'd say, that's inside healthcare. If you read about management and leadership at all, and some of you may and some of you won't, you'll be familiar with the work of Deming. Deming is a uh, kind of a bit of a guru when it looks to excellence in leadership. And he started off in manufacturing and is seen as you know, really one of those um, transforming people. But as he started to age he th and he realized how much work there was to be done in healthcare, he shifted his his work into supporting, and this is in his 80s and 90s, so he really, really was fully committed. He uh, made a commitment to work only with the healthcare industry. And this is one of his tenets. Management's overall aim should be to create a system in which everybody may take joy in their work. And if we didn't do that, then we would be failing as management and leaders. And it's been increasingly recognized that this is the work of the healthcare system. And so I'd say this is only being recognized in the last few years, like two or three years, as being actually a strategic, uh, some, something that you can do with strategy. But the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, which has led uh, the world, I think, in terms of recognizing how to create safety for patients and how to save lives from uh, preventable harm, has now added its next uh, major campaign is to building joy into work to prevent burnout. And this is something with science, with strategy, and with evidence, and it's something that I, I personally think is our responsibility as healthcare leaders. And again, the reason why I think looking at joy at work is so important is because it's strengths-based. It's looking at what do we build, what do we know, what do we measure, what, do we, what, do we, what barriers do we remove. And when, we look, when you look at what are the factors, again, from industry more so than healthcare, but it all relates, the factors that we know positively influence the experience of joy or that sense of wellness and satisfaction from doing a job well done is being part of a team where the team works well and the team's working at full scope of practice. It's working in a job where you get feedback on how you're doing. That's not audit and feedback for criticism, but actually positive feedback so you know what's working well, and you can find the gaps where you may need to do some improvement work. We know that it's very difficult to experience joy in work where there's no fairness. So it's making sure that your leaders and that you work in a diverse, so that you work in a diverse um, team, you don't have group think, and that everyone's treated equally and equitably. So when, when, uh, when there's bullying or when there's um, favoritism, those things decrease your joy. One of the most strongest predictors is if you have a good relationship with your direct manager. And physicians aren't very uh, um, experienced at actually having that type of relationship. We don't get a lot of uh, local leadership and we don't get a lot of uh, feedback from our 
I can tell you from my, I, I was a department head for six years, I can tell you I did not do a good job of giving regular feedback to all my members on what was working well. And I did have a good relationship with everybody, but I don't think I was really fulfilling the uh, objectives that's described here. And when we look at what actually all comes down to is like, are you working in a place where you have that sense of purpose, where you know why you're coming to work, what you're trying to achieve, and does that sense of purpose align with that of your team, and does it align with the organization with, with, within which you're working? So if you're working in a clinic and you don't all come together on a regular basis to talk about how you're, how's your practice doing, um, what, are, what, what are the system objectives? What are the priorities within the system? How can I better understand? Then it's very easy to understand why physicians may feel disconnected. The other thing is that we know we have a system that's in parallel. We have the healthcare system, and we have the doctors over here. And there's lots of history about why that is, um, but we need to figure out a different way to actually bring and reintegrate. The history is quite complicated and interesting, but I think we're on a different path. So if, if you want to figure out some strategies, so that's the, those are the factors that can increase individual joy, and those are the factors that when you bring them all together can actually help shift a system so that if you build those into the teams and into the workplace, you actually can start to generate joy at work. So I'm in a big deal role of the leader right now, and, but the, and the next thing I'm going to talk about is like, do you need to have a formal leadership role to have influence and to regain that sense of control. And the good news is that no, you don't. And this actually might not be good news for me in terms of uh, having positional authority, but how you actually achieve success by having a sense of purpose and a sense of control is actually way more about your influence and your connections. This is a study that was done by the University of Toronto studying um, healthcare teams within the NHS. And they went in and they did uh, observational, qualitative, and quantitative analysis of how teams in, were able to implement best practice within a uh, acute care setting. And they really were, were interested to find out what are the secrets of great change agents? How do people get stuff done? And on here, you can see what's up top is a very traditional organizational structure. You have probably someone like either it's the CEO or it's the department head or someone who's held accountable and, and holds or thinks they hold all the power. And then you have the vice presidents or maybe these are the directors. And then you have the people who actually do the work. I'm, I'm, I'm probably currently up, up here in one of these levels when I'm doing my leadership work. And these are all the, these are, but these are the people who actually create value. They're the people closest to the point of care and service. They're the people who are working day, day to day doing what the organization needs, which is to provide great care to their patients. Lucas is at the top, but when you map, up, map out who had the most influence using the uh, research of this, uh, this group from the U of T, you actually found out that this guy, gentleman, sorry, this gentleman, Josh, this gentleman here, is the person who has the most influence within his organization and within his team. He's the person who has the best emotional intelligence. He's the person who has the most connections to people regardless of position or power. He knows stuff and he is able to get stuff done. So if you can be Josh and have way more power and influence and ability to create change, Josh most likely has a greater sense of joy. He feels valued. He has strong relationships with people on his team and he feels like he knows what's going on and he's in alignment. I actually worry more about poor Anne over here. Anne's at the same level of the organization but doesn't have any of these connections or influence. And I really worry <laughs> about um, Emma as well. And I wish they weren't all women versus men. <laughs> this, this slide drives me crazy for that reason. But Emma has less influence than uh, these other people because she hasn't built, you know, she hasn't built those connections. So I find this fascinating, and it means that what you don't need is you don't need formal positional authority to be effective, to have control, and to feel, feel that alignment, which I find quite liberating. It means that um, you can lead from the place of where you stand rather than having to you know, take on a title or take on a, take on, a, get out of clinical practice. And I've done this mapping uh, in some of my work, whether it's with the, uh, the safety initiative within uh, the former Saskatchewan, the Saskatoon Health Region. And I've done this uh, work also when I was working with the Saskatchewan Medical Association, and I'm starting to do it now with the health authority. So it's very easy to draw a map of Saskatchewan. You just take a piece of paper and you put it on the, on the wall. 
And here I've got uh, physicians that I thought, um, that I thought and my peers thought uh, have influence. And some, it's color coded by a reason. Uh, some of them are quality improvement trained. Some of them are lean leaders. Some of them are formal leaders. Some of them keep going to PLI courses, but we can't see them in a formal leadership position, but they're still very interested in learning and more. And when you start reaching out to these people and ask them to do something uh, and say, hey, we believe in you. Would you be interested if we gave you some support, some coaching, some resources? Would you take on a, will you take on a challenge? They almost always say yes. And I did that in the safety initiative to identify new physicians, because often it's the same doctors over and over that keep getting asked to do the improvement work or the leadership work. And I know when I look at my personal journey of how I got to the point of close to burnout, I was one of those people. I was, I was like one of those go-to, go-to, go-to. And I thought, well, I can't do that to others. I have to find new faces. I have to bring more people into the crowd. So I've found my Joshes. I, I think I know who they are in my sphere, and now I need to find more of my Joshes, and I'm going to go out and try to identify them, bring them in, and give them the opportunities that I've been given. So that's the first strategy. Find, find your influencers or develop yourself as a, a future Josh. The next one is to really learn about how to do quality improvement. And I think that everybody should have two jobs. They should do their work, and we should be improving our work. And we should, that's, that's easy to say. It's actually very hard to do. But again, how people feel joy is by understanding their role and, and having the skills to be able to have impact and make change. And quality improvement science is something that I was lucky enough to um, basically serendipitously crash into when I was a critical care physician early on in my practice. And I just happened to cross paths with physicians that knew how to do this and showed me the, the way, there were Dr. D David Johnson and uh, Dr. Jamie Pania. And if you learn how to actually understand why things don't work, and then understand how to do t small tests of change to see how you can make a difference, not by yourself, but on a team, you can have huge results. And this is really, um, it, it's, it's the tenets of lean, it's the tenets of continuous quality improvement, and it really is how uh, healthcare systems are transforming themselves around the world. So this is just one of the examples of the uh, theory of knowledge of uh, uh, plan, do, check, act cycles, where you actually do small serious, serial tests of change. And we're training our physician workforce to do this, small, small, small steps, but this is a massive leap actually within our Saskatchewan healthcare uh, team. The, the Saskatchewan Medical Association and Health Quality Council partnered with funding and in alignment with the Ministry of Health to build Saskatchewan's Clinical Quality Improvement Program. And here's a picture of Dr. Nicolette Sinclair at the uh, capstone or the celebration event. Uh, she was one of our first 14 doctors who last year took, uh, were part of an 11-month program where on, week, on three or four weekends they got together, learned skills, um, learn some leadership skills, learn some quality improvement science, and in between they were doing online flipped classroom training and being coached by local leaders. And our 14 doctors went through the first time just blew me away. We had physicians like Dr. Sinclair who tested out how to uh, decrease the use of CT scanning for screening after endovascular aortic replacement, which is a very high-tech non-operative treatment for AAAs but was requiring a lot of radiation post-procedure. And so she was working out how can you safely do that type of uh, follow-up with less cost, less risk. We had another family physician who increased the HIV testing rate in a walk-in clinic. Just blew me away what they could do. And, and, the, the, and so the results were great. The outcomes were amazing in terms of the impact they had. But the best part of this was there was a side effect of joy. You could feel it in the room. They came on weekends excited, connected, engaged, and asking for more. The other thing is I know that it rippled into their clinics. And I was working in the operating room with a surgical assist, and I said, hey, John, tell me what's going on in your life. I haven't seen you for a while. And he said, I cannot tell you how much better work is because of whatever it is <laughs> my colleague is doing in that program. And I said, well, tell me more. And she said, we know how to redesign our team. And, the, and he just felt such a joy and connection to his patients. And, and his patients are university students dealing with mental health issues, something that's very, very prevalent and very tricky to manage. And his side, of, his side effect of joy was that his call, was, came from uh, quality improvement work that was being done by uh, 
by, by, by being a part in this. By, he wasn't even in the program, but his colleague was, so it ripples through, and that's been shown in the literature as well. And here's Dr. St. Clair being recognized at an international meeting for her work being celebrated, for having impact, and for using novel ways of improving care. And this is Dr. Sinclair and Dr. Babin, who was her sponsor. And it brought joy to these two doctors, plus it bought some, bought some international rec recognition. So we can become influencers. We can find our networks. We can find our people. We can train physicians to take on new skills. And that's uh, helping them uh, un understand what's going on in their practice, understanding what the system is within which they work, and understanding how to build a team and then test out improvements. Round one had 14 docs, round two had 22 docs, round three, we just did our selection, has 29 docs. So if we can start increasing the knowledge of, in our physicians, I think that's gonna have a huge impact and allow our physicians to feel that sense of control and influence. And then the final, uh, the, the, the next uh, strategy that we have is that we know from the positive contributors to uh, joy in work is having understanding your leadership and having strong connections with a sense of purpose and alignment. Well, we've done something really big in the last 12 months in Saskatchewan, and we did take 12 health authorities, 12, 12 health regions down to one health authority. And that has created a lot of opportunity that's never, that, ha that hasn't really uh, existed before, and uh, we can talk more a bit about why that is, but really the removal of the boundaries that patients and staff were experiencing, and I know as a physician I was experiencing, is starting to have some positive impact already. It also creates a lot of challenges but the opportunity that I think is the greatest one is that we know that high-performing healthcare systems and systems where there is increased joy for physicians are ones that physicians have active roles in planning, management, and governance of the healthcare system. So like I said before, and I referenced it briefly, we have a healthcare system, and then we have the doctors over here. And we know from looking at systems that work well that doesn't work well. It doesn't work well for patients. It doesn't work well for physicians. So the more we can integrate and partner, the better it's going to be. So this was the recommendation that came out from the advisory panel. The minister accepted it. And we have physicians in leadership positions that we've never had before. We have physicians on the board of governors for the health authority. We have Dr. Preston Smith and Dr. Janet Tatusis. We have we have a team, executive leadership team across the province for the health authority. Five of the 15 are physicians. That's very unusual. There's usually just one. <laughs> and you can imagine how difficult it would be for that one person to, to carry the weight of the entire clinical workforce, or the physician workforce. And these are physicians across the province. We have Dr. Stephanie Young in LaRange. We have Dr. Kevin Wasco in Surf Current. We have, and then there's three physicians in Sask that are based in Saskatoon. And we also have a team of chiefs of staff across the province. And we had chiefs of staff before. They were called senior medical officers. But we're really trying to build a diverse team with representation from across our province. I know we don't have anyone in the far north, but we do have physicians that are leading from where they, where they practice. But that's just the first level of leadership. We need to make sure that there's a strong connection of leadership and alignment throughout the entire system. And that's my next challenge, is to help build in those lower layers. Because I think when we have those physicians that are working in partnerships with the healthcare system, our voice will be louder, our influence will be greater. And we know from looking at other industries, the outcomes will be better for our patients and the joy will be better for us. In the US, they've showed, or it's actually a British researcher named Amanda Goodall, she's demonstrated that Amer the, um, there's a 25% improvement in performance on all aspects of performance, including staff experience and joy, and patient outcome and experience when physicians are in leadership positions. So it's not, it's not, <laughs> it's not just put docs in, in charge, but actually support, coach, lead, and develop those relationships. And I think we're gonna see, see, some, see some improvements over the next five years. And then the final thing, if we can start to get a better sense of control by understanding our system and having leaders in the right place, is how do you reconnect to your purpose? How do you have a strong sense of purpose? And the final strategy that I think we can all as individuals start to uh, explore and fully understand is the concept of patient and family-centered care. In 2008, um, there was a commissioned report done by the uh, Minister of Health 
and it was a one-year review of interviewing patients, interviewing communities, and interviewing providers as well. There was um, town halls, there was online, there were phone calls, there were written submissions. And uh, the commissioner, Tony Dagnoni, uh, produced the report called For Patient's Sake. And I would say that in our province, this has become our North Star. We were challenged by um, our Minister of Health to really change the way healthcare is designed and delivered so that it truly is patient-centered. And I would argue that right now, most care can, remains provider-centric. Patients will come when we tell them. They will go where we tell them. They will receive care how we tell them. And we're really working hard in our province to change that so it's in partnership. And you will see if you work in our province, I know many are from, you're, you're all from here, but some of you have gone away. But for those that are working in the province, um, and you've, you've been part of improvement work or any of the transformation work, you'll know that patients and families are present as full partners, full voice. We train them, we support them, we even give them honorarium. And we really need patients and families to be part of the redesign of the healthcare system. And for me, that has really changed my work. It started for me with one young man and his mother who I, I, I wanted some feedback. I was trying to learn how, how can I be better. And this young man had been living in our ICU for about six weeks. I'd saved his life. I thought asking his mother would be a pretty easy way for me to get some positive feedback, uh, to be honest. And when I asked her, can you tell, it, tell me what it's like to be part of, you know, to be receiving care as part of our unit, she said, you suck. And then that's not her, not, those are her real words. And I actually, I, found, I was actually, I was like, what do you mean we suck? He said, well, you kick us out when he's the most sick. You kick us out when you talk about him. You kick him out when he's scared. You kick me out when I'm scared. All the times that he needs me the most as a mother and I need to be there as a mother um, is when I'm not allowed in the unit. And I was like, light bulb. So we invited her on rounds and we've changed from that one simple conversation. That woman was brave enough to actually tell me what it was really like to receive care. Um, we've changed the culture in our intensive care units and that's actually spread to uh, open family presence policy. We're the first province in the country and we're the first large system in the world to have a policy of um, full access, as long as it's safe and it makes sense clinically, for patients to tell us who is their family and to have them present on the units. I'm not gonna say it's easy. I'm not gonna say it doesn't come with its challenges, but we have an ability now to actually say, okay, how do we make this work? And this is a picture of how we actually do. This is my colleague, Dr. Kochuk. I know this picture is seven years old because that little baby inside just turned seven this week. And uh, we've been doing this for many years in our units. And I can tell you, having patients and rounding at the bedside with patients and having their families physically present beside me as we go through the entire medical list and make a plan together has given me joy in a way that I never imagined was possible. And it's better than it was, even was when I was in medical school and I was just, um, you know, wide-eyed and completely heart in. So can this work? Is this just someone who's an optimist and a bit of a Pollyanna uh, um, with some crazy ideas? Well, we know that it can work. We know that it works in other industries. We know that it works in manufacturing. We know that it works in um, banking. We know that it works at Starbucks. But does it work in healthcare, which is our industry and it's our place of work and it's our thing that we should be passionate about? Well, the answer is yes, it can work. It's very difficult. It doesn't work every time. But where it does work, it takes years and it takes constant attention and it, it, constant alignment back to that sense of purpose. And the example that I think is probably the one that I like the most there are other Canadian examples. But in Guelph, Ontario, there's a small hospital. It's not an entire province, but it's a small hospital where they, had a, they set an intention in 2010 to provide the safest care that they possibly could and to be the safest hospital in Ontario. And they used all of these methods. They used um, continuous improvement. They used lean, just as we do. They uh, focused on staff experience. And they focused on liberating staff to make improvements in their place of work and have a sense of control. And they have seen results. They have um, their just last their, their last calendar, their last financial year, so just ending in March 27, tw March 2018. 91% of staff say they look forward to coming to work in the morning. The average in Canada is 
91% of staff describe their work as a great place to work. The average in Canada is 51%. They have uh, reduced falls in hospital by half, and their mortality rates are the lowest or amongst the lowest in Ontario. Their, in, their salary costs have gone up by 7%. But their cost of care has gone down by 1%. And if you know anything about health care, it's actually 70% of, of costs or salaries. So to be able to actually bend the cost curve in the face of that is remarkable. And this is not just a one-off. This is trending over time, and it's sustainable. But how they say it's, they say it's amazing, and it's constant work. So we have to pay attention to this. But it really is a place where um, I haven't been to St. Mary's, but one of my uh, colleagues has. She says, you walk in there, there's joy in work everywhere. People are happy, they're engaged, they're, they know what they're doing, they know why they're doing it, and then for the public, they can say that they're doing it at a lower cost. So I think this is a way forward. I really do think that when we look at how can we redesign our healthcare system uh, to make joy in work be prevalent, be the normal, to be what's experienced by all, we can do it. And we can do it by physicians and leadership positions. We can do it by physicians understanding their roles. If they're not in a formal position, they can lead from where they stand by using their influence and by using their connections. By learning the basics of quality improvement so that we can do our work and that we can improve our work. And then by reconnecting with our patients and our families and really figuring out how we get back to how, why we went into medicine in the first place. And I'll tell you, if you do those things, the side effect will be joy. And that's an amazing side effect to be able to prescribe into a healthcare system as it's going through system transformation. So I would really want to know more about what your experiences are and what your observations are. And you can challenge me, and I'll say, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> but this is how I see the world, and this is how I'm intending to try to build joy and in work into your place of work so that we can be better for ourselves, our families, and most importantly, I think, for our patients. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Doesn't that make you feel that it, you, all, you want to be on Susan's team? Come on, I need you. <laughs> I need you. <laughs> yes, sir. I'd like to address the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is uh, you're really good at unloading your situation and explaining what you've walked through to survive to get thus far and picked out some wonderful people like Coco and I recognize a few of the other faces because yeah. they're really bright lights in the system and they're working really hard because they have overcome incredible challenges. But here's the problem. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that if you have a problem at work or with somebody and it ends up affecting you, you can't go to somebody and say, I'm sorry, this is what happened to me today. This is the way I'm treating my family. This is the way I'm reacting to my kids. And this is what I feel about my patients. And you can't sit down with another employee and tell that because the employee will automatically chart it. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else will look at it and say, this person has problems. They can't get along with their family. They're doing this to their kids. They're doing this to their patients, etc." Oop, there's a red flag. I think you're talking, so I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want, I'm not trying to say that, I'm not going to say that's not your experience. I'm going to say that's not my experience. Uh, I think when you look at creating a, a, a safe culture and a culture that's just, uh, we need to make it safe so that anybody, regardless of position or background or experience, can voice when they have concerns. And I think, again, that's why the work on wellness is so important, uh, that we are uh, decreasing the stigma of asking for help. We're decreasing, we're, we're reaching out to our colleagues more and we're understanding the importance of um, physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional wellness as part of who we are, and that's important. I, I, I also, uh, my job as chief medical officer does deal with physicians at risk, physicians living, and, and I would not want to be part of a system where if, if a physician identified themselves as having a problem, that it actually became the problem, it was the physician. It's, the problem is the system. And so I think, part, I think what you're describing is uh, confirming how much work we have to do to make it so that you can reach out and say, 
Craig, I had a really lousy day, or that Craig feels safe to say, Susan, you're not yourself today. Is there something you want to talk about? And that's not done with stigma, and it's not, not done with data collection. It's done as part of support, and it's done as part of continuous improvement. So that, that is something that we need to work through. That's why I need more of you, <laughs> absolutely, because I can't do this by myself. But I can tell you the people I'm working to surround us by with will hopefully think like me. <laughs> Dr. Oh, Conley? Long yeah. way to go. Thanks very much for the presentation. I'll just point out there was a landmark uh, article on um, physician wellness and healthcare wellness as a missing quality indicator published in the Lancet. It was the lead article in 2009. Yep. And it was done by uh, a sociologist and two general internists from Calgary. So uh, yes. Dr. Jane Lemaire leads the program and is also establishing WellDoc Alberta. So she's someone you might want to contact uh, yes. who has been working at this for over a decade. No, you're absolutely right. And we, you, can measure, you can define it, you can measure it, you can set targets, and you can actually work toward it, primarily using quality improvement methods, but by also there's many other policy, there's all kinds of things that have to go with that. But that's a, that's a great connection, Dr. Conley. Thank you. I'm not sure whether this is directly related to your talk, but I wondered if uh, having more women in, uh, in uh, medicine uh, created more joy. And I noticed um, um, in the class, in my class, it was only 12% of the graduates were female, and now we're 50-50. Uh, so I wondered how are you doing in getting uh, women into leadership roles, and uh, when are we going to be 50-50? When will be, uh, well, it's a great target. We know that women, so <laughs> there's a lot in what you said there. Um, it's all good. Um, we, we know that uh, women are underrepresented. They're, they're, they're equally represented as they enter med school. Uh, they're equally represented by number as they practice. They are not equally represented uh, when you get into leadership positions. And there's a history behind that. There's actually a lot of, again, there is more work understanding what are the barriers and is, there, is that a problem. We know from other industries that when you have more women in leadership positions, it's good for the shareholder. Uh, we know that. Um, we know that uh, you need, a, you can't have one. You need three or more uh, to have um, that impact start to happen. I'm proud that we have women on, so this is the ELT. Um, I'm one of two, of the five physicians, two are women. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, I think that's as close as we can get right now. And when we look at our uh, chief of staff positions, um, we do have um, women that are working there across the province. And I'm very proud of that as well. I think that uh, it's not as good just to put women there. <laughs> you have to actually help support and identify women who want to do this work, just as you need to support men who want to uh, do and, and do this work, because I think it's important you have the right people with the right skill doing the right work. But we also know that diversity is important, and having be able to see yourself in your leadership structure is important. So I don't know if we can say more women creates more joy. I know that we can say having more women creates a more representative workforce, and that should get us to a higher performance. And I would hope that we get more joy, but I don't know. Maybe somebody else has literature that supports that. Well, I, I want to thank you for giving this talk. I think it's a long time overdue. There you are, sir. Uh, I did uh, the course in healthcare ad, uh, administration that the U of S used to offer yeah. for people who were, got into administration through the back door like I did. And I wrote a paper on total quality management at that time. Uh, I also had left just at the time when we changed from the old system to the uh, district system. And I came back nine, year, nine years later and found medical, a medical community that very much was felt removed from everything that was going on. Yep. And I wrote a letter to the, that time, Saskatoon Health District CEO, uh, saying that what they needed to do was get the doctors back involved in planning and in decision making. I, I did not get a very good response. So I'm so happy to see that you're doing this. I want to encourage you and go at it. Thank you. They're, they're definitely, and, and you can argue, you can talk about whether it was intentional or unintentional. There was definitely a separation of the physician as a uh, leader. Some of that was owned by our profession. Some of that is owned by the system. 
Um, we know that that doesn't work, and I think this is a chance, it's a start of a chance to be able to uh, do better and be better. So I thank you for your encouragement. I think the thing that I learned, um, how, part of how I got my joy back as well was learning that if I work well with administration, they work well with me, and I actually become more um, influential, and I get a better sense of purpose. The big, big, I thought the elephant in the room was going to be um, most physicians don't work in an acute care facility. Most physicians work in their office. Most physicians work in their practice. And how are we going to work through that? And that, I think, is one of the, it's, it is a bit of an elephant, but it's also an opportunity because I think that through the work of the SMA, through a health authority that actually understands that and can start to support physicians working in where they do their work, we're going to be able to get to, won't be easy, but we can get to a point where no matter where you practice, you, you and your patients will benefit by these sorts of strategies. Oh, interesting. We should talk. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so that stole a bit of my thunder because oh, that was sorry. part of what I was going to say, Susan. Okay. So thank you for yeah. your comments. Uh, and thank you for that awareness because I think um, one of the ways the system for the last large number of years has balanced the books is on the back of our patients and our community and uh, moving things out of institutions where it's easy to measure and see what's going on into community uh, with less than adequate resources and supports and offloading of, of uh, costs. And um, so I think, to me, that's a really important area. And I'm not sure that people working in community are going to feel particularly that they have uh, a degree of control until we sort that. So I'm really glad to hear that that's on your radar because I really do think that's significant. Oh, I think it's quite, uh, absolutely critical. Um, we, we, if, we, if we actually can achieve what we say we do, we have to figure out together how to do what you're describing, I think. Mm -hmm. Again, not easy, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure, I think we can figure it out. We can learn from other systems that have figured it out. So. Well, those of us who uh, live in Saskatchewan are really uh, grateful for Susan returning to Saskatchewan and doing really fine work uh, on behalf of us and uh, the residents of Saskatchewan. Thank you very much for your lecture. Thank you. Can I say one thing? I just want to say one more thing. Being invited to come speak at my university um, to my people um, is a, such an honor, Anita, and I want to thank you because you've been a huge part of my career path and my personal development. So this, to me, I can't, I can't tell you enough about, uh, I'm a, enough, or I can't say enough about what an honor it is to be spending my morning here with you. So thank you, Anita, and thank you to the Alumni Association, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.